All right, so funny story. I've searched now and then to try and find Atherin's original all-metal RDC, and no matter how many train shows I went to, or how many times I searched on eBay and other places, I was never actually able to find one. So then, just recently, I went onto eBay and thought about it, thought, hey, why not search for one again? I bet it won't come up like usual. And then, once you know it, one that was still in its original box, basically unused, came up for $20. So, of course, that was an instant buy, no matter what the condition was. And here it is. It's got some surface rust around the body. I think I can clean that up, though. But as you can see, aside from just a little bit of track time that you can see on the treads, this is unbuilt, basically brand new, in its original box. So I think that was quite a find. And now I'm going to get this thing built and restored and looking as good as possible. Now for a very brief history, Atherin introduced this model with the full range of RDC 1, 2, 3, and 4 kits in 1954. They were priced at $14.95 for a powered model, about $170 in today's dollars, or $6.95 for a dummy unit. Now they had never made any plastic models up to this point, which is why this was an all metal one made from die cast and formed sheet metal. And this one would only be in production for a few years before they changed over to the plastic RDC in the 1958 catalog. Before I even attempt to do anything like adding the details, painting it, anything like that, of course, the first thing I need to do is fully disassemble this thing and restore all the parts into better condition than what they're in. And looking over this, I think this really is just surface rust, so I should be able to clean this up and maybe even buff it to a really nice shine. So I'm just gonna pull these pieces apart. Ather did some basic assembly on these, but left most of it unassembled so that it could be taken apart easily for adding all the detail parts. See, it looks like there's just uh, one screw, maybe two, that are holding it together at the moment, but I think it's only this one. Yep, just the one. Okay, let's see. I don't want to break any wires. Gotta be careful. Where's that wire running to? It looks like there's a piece of tape inside of there. But the body does slide apart. This has an outer shell, an inner shell, and then a two-piece chassis. This is really a pretty clever design for its time, I think. Having a two-piece chassis with the wire running through like that. Normally they just have all these things right outside where you can see them, especially on the plastic RDCs that came later. And this motor here, from what I've read, these were made by Pittman. I think the drive truck is also made by Pittman. So this was before Atherin was making their own motors and drive parts. In fact, at the time, Atherin wasn't making anything from plastic at all. Their freight car kits were wood with maybe some metal parts on them. And then the RDC, of course, is all metal. Let's see, I should get this further apart. So that is held in place by this plate underneath, insulator plate. And is there another screw somewhere holding that? Nope, that was just stuck in place from oil that had dried from sitting for decades. And as for that wire, let's see. It looks like it's only tied to the rear truck. So that means I should be able to remove the truck and just pull that wire out. Slide that over. Yeah, that's just twisted in there. So I will untwist that. And out it goes. So I can 
take that off from the floor. And this is really a pretty heavy floor with all these cast metal parts on it. Actually, that's very nicely detailed. Well, I'm already impressed with what I'm seeing on this kit for its design and quality. Motor's stiff. Something in there is definitely seized. I don't think it's the motor itself. It's the uh, gearing that's having the problem here. I'll need to pull everything apart anyway, so might as well start here. That plate just lifts off. And that is all metal gearing in there. Again, no plastic to be found. I think I see what's seizing. I can barely even move these axles. There must be some nasty old grease in there. I think the side frames are holding it on. How can I get this apart? Oh, I think these are what's holding it together, or at least part of it. Okay, there goes the motor. And yeah, the motor turns just fine. No problems there. I think that'll be easy to fix up. I don't even see any rust around it. So this is in good shape. Really good shape. And check out the commutator. All that's on there is just the oxidation on the copper. No dirt or anything. In fact, this may have only had a factory test run at the most. I don't think the original owner who bought this thing ever ran it at all. So as far as I can tell, this is as close to a brand new model as I am ever going to find. Here we go. There we go. Now I think I can get things apart. Take out these side frames. There we go. Now I can get the pieces out. It's not just the axles that were stiff either. The gears were really stuck in there. Pilot. That's not coming out, so I won't even try. I don't want to damage anything. Well, I guess I should get to cleaning all this stuff. Okay, this might be silly. Just a little idea I had. I'm going to try soaking these parts in some 409, see what happens. Maybe that'll soften up the grease. I've tried using alcohol for this kind of stuff before and it works over time, but it seems to work kind of slowly. And this stuff is made for cutting kitchen grease, so maybe you can cut old oil grease. Never know until you try. Or until someone else tries and posts online about it. Well, while that's soaking, let's check out the motor and see what the condition of this is. Now, before I even try running it, I better add some oil. It has a metal self-centering bearing at the bottom, but the top, it looks like it's just fiber. I've seen that kind of method done before, especially on old Marx trains, where they just use the fiber plate as the uh, bearing bushing for the shaft. And it works. It's uh, more likely to wear out over time, but it does work. It works. Not perfect, though. I think I need to clean up the commutator. All that oxidation is probably blocking the uh, brushes from making good contact. But, yep, there's something going on in there. 
It's getting better though. Actually, just running it like that is kind of polishing it up. Seems like it's working pretty well. A lot of arcing in there though. Maybe it needs more spring tension. Oh yeah. This brush is all right. But you can hear when I press on this one, it speeds up. So I need to see if I can put more spring tension on that brush. As for how these are sprung, looks like the brush holders themselves are the springs. So in that case, the way to increase the tension, unscrew that. There we go. Okay, yeah, you see there, that brush is almost straight, so it's not gonna put much of any tension onto the commutator at all. Easy way to fix that, just bend it. That should be better. So after some further adjustment and adding an insulator in there to make sure that brush can't contact the side by accident, I think I have this running about as well as it's ever gonna get. Low speed control really isn't great. And it's definitely got a high top speed. Also, looking at the worm, you can see that this is a double spiral or a double thread worm which means that it turns two teeth for every one rotation of the motor. And with the gearing that I see in the truck, I think this thing's gonna fly at top speed. Now to clean that old grease out of the worm, I'm gonna try using a brass wire wheel here, see if that does it. Just go a little at a time. I have to put some pressure on it to make sure it can get down into those grooves. Okay, I think that's about as clean as I'm going to get it. That looks pretty good to me. I've had these all soaking in the 409 for a little while. Let's see if that loosens some stuff up. That looks pretty clean to me. Okay, I think this is actually looking pretty good. So once I'm done brushing these off, I'm just gonna clean them up with alcohol. How about the old grease inside of here? Yeah, I think that might actually be working pretty well. Let's see if these parts are pretty well cleaned up now. It's still rolling kind of stiff in there though. And after checking the axle with calipers, I think they actually undersized these slots just slightly. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna take this uh, 30 seconds drill bit and just run that in there a little and see if that helps. It does feel a little better. Yes, yeah, so I'll just keep up with this until I get all of these axles and gears turning really freely. All right, after some more work there, I think I have things turning freely, just the way they need to be. So I'll get this back together, get it oiled, and see how it works. Since these are all helical gears, 
you have to do opposite direction for each one or they won't be able to mesh correctly. Add some fresh oil to each of these. First oil they've seen in almost 70 years, I'm sure. And now to grease it, I'll just spread some around a few of the gear teeth. These gears are all the same size, but since they link directly to the worm, that'll help it to spread through as it runs. Now with just one in there, I might as well make sure things are turning, which it feels like they all are. I think the original Model Railroad or performance review of these mentioned that they had terrible low speed control, like a minimum 35 scale miles per hour or something. So I have to wonder if then a lot of that had to do with the uh, axle and gear slots just being way too tight. Of course, we'll find out once I get this reassembled and see how it performs. So that makes sense to have short screws both top and bottom because they're fitting into the same screw hole. So if you had anything longer, one would run into the other and neither would be able to tighten correctly. This really is a much more complicated system than the rubber band drive that came later on. Yeah, that looks good now. These side frames are able to twist a little bit just because of how they're built. So that's perfectly fine if they're not completely level. Now that plate fits there. Motor goes down through the top. Leave it slightly loose and start the other screw which wants to stick to the magnet, of course. Now that should be able to turn without seizing. Much better. Still not a perfect runner, but I think part of that is just because those gears need to wear into each other a little. That's working pretty well. Okay, well, now that I've got it running, I think I can move on to fixing up the body. There is a lot of surface rust on here, but I'm pretty sure that this is stainless steel. If that's the case, this should clean off pretty easily. So I'm going to try using some evapo rust here. Maybe that'll do a good job of taking it off. Put some onto a Q-tip. This area will be underneath a much larger part. Oh yeah. That is taking it off fast. So I'm gonna use this around the whole body. See how things turn out. Just wiping it down was taking a really long time. So I'm gonna soak a section at a time in this tin, maybe even move it to a larger one if needed. We'll see how that turns out. Well, I think this stuff is doing the trick. I've had this end soaking for a few minutes now. And when I take a cloth to it, Wipes the rust right off. Let's say I've got the body really well cleaned up now, so I'm just going to wash this with some uh, soap and water and then give it a good buffing. We'll see how it looks. 
Some of the other parts also had some rust on them, so I'm taking care of them too. And I'm not 100% sure, but I think this solution is also taking the oxidation off of the zinc. So if that's actually working, then that'll be nice because some of these have some very heavy oxidation on them. Okay, I did a little buffing there just to kind of test it out and see how it would look. And I think this may have actually been tin-plated steel instead of stainless steel. So with the tin just kind of gone, because that's a sacrificial metal when it's plated on steel, it's going to end up having kind of an uneven shine, even nicely buffed smooth like that. So I might try... Well, buffing over the whole thing, giving it a good cleaning, and then maybe I'll be able to give it a brush plating. We'll see if that works. Well, I think that'll be a useful discovery. Evaporust also takes the tarnish off of zinc. I could have left this soaking for longer. I only had it in there for an hour, but you can see that the metal is um, a lot brighter and shinier than it was before. And then some of the other parts that had less oxidation... They practically look like they're right out of the mold. And that rough feeling that you get from the oxidation is totally gone. These feel smooth as can be. I don't have the main part of the body ready to put on yet, but I do at least want to do some reassembly of the chassis here and give it a test run. So I'll just uh, start by putting that wire back through there. That goes into the hole in the truck, wraps around, twists it around a few times. So now that wire will hold in place. Power truck fits right here. Okay, and then the rear truck fits back here using this long screw which has a spring on it. Oh, and this washer has to go right here. That needs to be insulated. Okay, there's the main chassis. That wire has to stay in there. Plate fits down on top. Yeah, that seems like it's in a good spot. I think it's the body here, the inner body that Kind of holds things together. Yeah, that's where the screw goes through. Yeah, but once you finally find the screw hole and get things lined up, it fits pretty nicely. And of course, the ends will go there and there, but those won't stay in place without the outer body. Same for this. That feels like a pretty heavy model. Should have decent traction, even with only four wheel drive. Let's see if this goes. I need to give the wheels a little cleaning. That actually runs pretty nicely. Pretty much no low speed control, but that's to be expected with the kind of gearing combined with the uh, fairly small and low torque motor. But overall, that's running nice and smoothly. So this is definitely looking good. To do the buffing on the body, I'm gonna use this uh, tabletop buffing wheel instead of the Dremel. I think that'll get through things a little faster and make the shine and polish a little more even. Let's just start that up. Make sure I've got some fresh stuff on the wheel.
this is a really cheap table I put together. It's kind of wobbly. And to do the actual buffing, just uh, put that against there gently. You want to make sure not to go the other way with the edge against the wheel because then it'll just fly out of your hand and you could possibly hurt yourself. Yeah, that's already doing quite a bit of work there, so I'll just uh, keep at that until it's all shiny. Okay, I've got this piece nice and buffed. And of course you can see around there the differences between the tin and steel. So I'm gonna try replating this to see if I can even things out. And to do that, I'm gonna try using this uh, Caswell copy chrome plating. It's a, I think it's a blend of metals that basically looks like chrome when it's done, but it's uh, something a little less caustic. So I'll just have to soak the plating brush in there. Get off some of the excess liquid. Connect the ground to the body. And then slowly work around it. And that should put a thin layer of the metal onto the steel. And I'll be able to do more buffing on that to really give it a nice finish. So I decided to do a quick test buffing to see how things were going to turn out before I plated the whole body. And it seems like the copy chrome maybe doesn't take to steel and tin plating quite as well as it would other metals. I've tried it on brass before and it works great on that, but on this it doesn't seem to be doing quite the job that I want. So that's unfortunate, but I do at least have Alclad Chrome Metalizer, so I'm going to give that a shot. I've seen this used on, well, for painting stainless steel passenger cars before, mainly by um, Antonio FP45 on the Model Railroader Forum. So I'm going to give that a shot and see how things turn out. As long as I'm going to be trying out the chrome on the main body, I might as well also get some of these other parts ready since I want them to be the same color. The metal is actually pretty clean. There's very little to file off around here, so I'm just going over it gently. A couple spots where I see small amounts of flash. There's really not much work to do on getting these parts ready. So since I'll be doing metalizing on here instead of polishing, I'm going to go ahead and put on a few detail parts just so that everything can blend as well as possible. So I've got the little bag of details here, which should be complete since it's still sealed. It looks like it's a staple there. Let's see what the condition of these parts is. I wouldn't be surprised if something's rusted. Okay, so we've got the uh, detail springs, grab irons, couplers, um, number boards, all that good stuff. And it looks like about the only rust is on the screws, so that's good. Well, looks like there's some rust on these uh, grab irons. So I'll do a little de-rusting and then I can get on to putting those parts together. So looking at the instruction sheet, I think it would be best if I only put the grab irons on for now because the tabs from the, uh, um, well, data plates also go into the sides of the inner body here. So I'll paint, metalize, the, metalize those separately and then assemble the body, and then I'll be able to press them through, and, and that should all look fine. While those parts are soaking and de-rusting, I also pulled the trucks back apart so that I could clean up the side frames and get the spring details in. I've already done that on one, which you can see here. The springs are steel, kind of heavy, so they snap in tightly and don't need any glue to hold in place but they only include the exact number that you need, so you've gotta be absolutely careful putting these in. 
I'm just putting it on the edge of a knife here. And then starting with one tab, press it. Starting one tab, and very carefully moving that down. And it's hard to get it on the first try. In fact, it's taking me a few tries for each one. And it takes a lot more concentration than I can do while the camera's here. So I'm going to shut that off for a moment. Okay, all the springs are in. And those are really tedious to install. So I like that they provided actual springs for the details. But it would have been even better if they thought to provide more than just the exact number. I ended up losing two of them. So on one side frame, I replaced those with the springs off of some Bachmann knuckle couplers. So those will look just fine. I'm planning to paint these whole side frame silver anyway, so that should help to blend it a bit. Installing these grab irons isn't so bad once you've got the hang of it. So they designed it so that the grab irons go through and then you just bend them over um, nice and flat like that. And then they hold in place pretty tight. And then once you are finishing the installation, that allows this to slide back together and it can even help to hold the grab irons in further. So the way I'm doing this is I insert the grab iron into the two holes. Just kind of hold that down a little bit while I push the inside pin to get it started. Then I can kind of grip the pliers around that little edge there and then squeeze that flat and it leaves no marks at all on the body. And for the other pin, just kind of hold that down again while I use the pliers to bend it like this. And now there's another grab iron installed. These aren't perfectly made, but they should look pretty good when it's all done. So as I was looking at all these steel parts of the model, I noticed that anywhere that the tin plating is gone has become extremely prone to rust, like even beyond what I thought before with just my previous cleaning. Like when I washed this in the sink just to prep it for painting, some parts started to redevelop rust only minutes after I took them out of the water and started drying it off. So I'm gonna give all these uh, good coating of primer just to help seal them and hopefully that will prevent any further rust from forming. All right, so this is all the parts that'll be the stainless steel color. The uh, body, I sanded that down so it would look, be as smooth as possible. And then I also have the uh, other end here, as well as the top ventilation and the number boards and such. And it's over 100 degrees up here today. Definitely not ideal painting conditions, but I think I can get through this and still have some good results. So according to um, someone on the Model Railroader forums, Antonio FP45, who does a lot of metalizing, when you're doing stainless steel, you want to start with New York Central light gray as the base coat. And so once this is all on and dry, I'll put on Alclad Chrome Metalizer. And hopefully, once everything's finished, this will look like actual stainless steel. All right, so now that the base coat is on, I can put on the metalizing coating. The base coat is important for Alclad because the actual metalizer coating is transparent, just makes it look like metal. So I have the airbrush turned down to about 15, 16 PSI, and you basically paint this on there like a brush. And that might still be a little high. I should turn that down a little more. Let's see, this airbrush also allows the amount of output to be limited. Let's give that a try. Still a lot of output. 
Oh, that's about right, yep. Okay, so you just uh, go along slowly until you have a nice, smooth, metallic surface. All right, I just finished spraying everything. The results on the cast metal parts are amazing. That actually looks like metal, the way that coats. On the uh, main body, though, it turned out all right, but kind of patchy looking and rough in a few spots. So even though I wanted to give this as much protection as possible with the primer, I think I'm going to strip this one down and redo it. I don't know, maybe figure out some kind of a smoother undercoat because the roughness of that primer I used, it just kind of messed things up in a few areas. There, that looks a lot better. I just had to use a much smoother primer coat than what I did before. All right, so now I've also got a very light gloss clear coat on there to seal the metalizer so it's ready for decals. And while I was looking back through Antonio's steps, I realized that I did miss one step before putting the Alclad on. That was making sure that the surface was absolutely like a wet gloss instead of the sort of mostly gloss finish of the paint. But I think it still turned out well enough, so it should still be a good looking model when it's done. Now, as for the decals, I searched for quite a while to find the Santa Fe RDC lettering and I just couldn't find any so all that did come up was this very old set of micro scale decals for Santa Fe doodle bugs so I'm going to see what I can do with these to make this look at least close enough all right so I cut the letters into individual pieces and in order to apply them as carefully as possible I'm soaking them in warm water for almost a minute each to get rid of all the glue on them. Then I gently slide them in place, straighten them out, and then dry them off, and that seems to be working. All right, now I have these number board decals on, and these were kind of difficult to do because all I had were actually the numbers, so the DC and the dash on each one are actually um, trimmed and spliced ones and zeros. So I think that actually turned out pretty well, considering what I had to work with. So now it's just getting on to the setting solution, and then the Santa Fe decal on the front, and some clear coat. And there's the front cab done. This is actually my third attempt painting it, because this is my first time using true color paints, and I just wasn't used to it. So now that I've got that process down, the coat of paint and uh, both colors went down nice and smooth. Um, the masking separation isn't the best I've ever done. I've touched that up a little bit, so it looks pretty good now. Silver paint, I just uh, brushed that on as carefully as I could. That's turned out pretty well. I trimmed two of these front decals in order to piece together and make the one, and that has fit in place nicely, and really looks just about perfect. So once that setting solution is done and the last paint there has had a bit of time to dry, We'll give this its clear coat, and we'll get to putting this together. Now I've got the chassis painted silver and put back together. That turned out looking nice, and it still runs well. So now the next thing will be to put on this insulating card, which goes across there and holds the wire down. And I think that's really all this does, just hold the wire down. I don't really know what it's insulating. So they say to do that with glue, so... Let's put a little super glue down a few areas. Pull that wire tight so that it stays out of the way. It'll still be free to move within that slot even after this has been glued down. But with this in place, it won't be able to go all around to wherever it wants. Once that glue is dried, I can poke or drill out the holes for the screws to pass through. Now here's my 3D printed interior to go in there. And the resin print turned out real nice. You can see those little armrests on the chairs and everything. And I've got the cutout for the motor and the uh, window blinds for the bathroom areas. 
And I couldn't find any good reference for what the colors were for the Santa Fe RDCs on the inside, so I just kind of looked through a bunch of photos and took a guess. So blue seats, I did kind of a cream color for the walls, and then uh, the floor is just black, brown. And then for the shell insert, I also painted that the same kind of cream color so that the walls, the roof or ceiling would all be the color that they're supposed to be and that'll also seal it against rust. So the interior, let's see, gotta line that up right because there's the cutout there for the motor. So this should just slide in. It's a really tight fit though, so this might take me a minute to get inside correctly. There we go. That's a really good fit. That should keep things looking real nice once this is fully assembled. And this bit that sticks out here, that inserts into the end piece, just like that. So you also get just a little bit of interior detail in the cabs themselves. Although I didn't print a piece to actually go inside of the cab, but it's so hard to see into that section anyway. I decided not to take the time there and just focus on the passenger interior alone. I've also got the main body painted and done here. I think those decals really blended in great. And it's got that nice metal finish from the Alclad. Maybe not quite the perfect stainless steel look I was going for, but close enough that I'm happy with how it looks. So, let's see here. There's this, uh, there's another one of these insulating cards. It's supposed to wrap around the top here, like that. I'm just trying to figure out the easiest way to get this together. I think... I can do it like this. Okay, things are looking good here. I've got the top piece screwed in place here, which helps to hold the outer and inner shells together. So now I'm uh, just uh, sliding in these window pieces. Just being real careful doing that. And once they're in position, they have a pretty nice flush fit between the two shells. It's a little tricky to get them in this way. But they are going. You can see on the other side here, I've got one in place. And to get all this held together the rest of the way, now I can slide in the underframe, or the floor piece anyway. That is a really tight fit. Just have to get it started though, and then the rest shouldn't be too bad. Okay, now it's starting to go. And once again, I'll just kind of work that in gently. Working on the window glass now to go in these end pieces. And they give an extra piece of this uh, window material. So you just trim that to shape and then take your piece and drop it inside. At least this is the way I'm doing it. I'm just kind of dropping it in there, getting it in position. Just about there, okay. And now that's where it needs to be. So I'll just take some of this tester's window glue, put a couple small drops in there. There, and then once that dries, the window will be held in place. And then I can install this to the end of the main body. All right, so attempt one, getting things together, didn't go quite so well. After pulling things back apart, I found that this top card was just too large, so I trimmed down one of the sides and then a little off each end. So I'll get things back together now, and we'll see if it fits this time. 
All right, that worked out a lot better for fitting. And I got the window glass properly slid into place now too. That was being pushed out of the way before by that piece of paper. So now I'm just getting the ends in place. I've already got the silver one on. So I just need to get the red Santa Fe one in there. Got to work around my interior. It definitely created some complications for assembly, but I think the end results will be well worth it. Get it past those grab irons. And get it fit into the fluting too. It's a really tight fit. There it goes. Okay. So that is on there. That looks good too. So now I just need to get that screwed in place. And one thing that I found while I was working on the other end was that the regular length screws that were provided with the kit were a little too long and they were running into the interior. Of course, that's not a problem if you're not putting an interior in there. You'd never even notice otherwise. But in my case, I have to use these shorter screws so that things will fit together without getting pushed out of place. Now, getting on to these last details, I believe these parts are all just supposed to be able to press into place with the uh, two sleeve design. So I'll just uh, firmly push on that. It's going in one end so far, not quite going into the other end. Let's just try the tip of the file here. Move that around a little bit. Okay, try that again. Okay, now that's slipping in. Okay, so that is in there. Doesn't feel very tight though, so I think I will use a little bit of glue to help hold this in place. Touch there. And a touch more right there. That should be enough. Very carefully. put the glue on the inside instead, but there's really no way to do that in this case, so just have to be really careful. Yeah, that'll hold in there. So now I just have to do the rest of them around here. Okay, so most of these parts really don't want to cooperate and press into place, so I'm just trimming the tabs down so that they're a lot shorter, and then just gluing them in place, and so far that's looking a lot better, so I'm just going to do that for the rest of these instead of struggling with trying to press them in and potentially damaging the paint, which would be very unfortunate. Now the last detail is the couplers. They provide these metal dummy couplers, and I'm not planning on having this pull anything, so I might as well go ahead and use them instead of trying to install KDs or anything else. These have these little metal sleeve that drops into place, then you put the screw through that and tighten it down just like this. The coupler can swivel freely and looks pretty good on there. Well, with the bodywork done, all that's left is to put the chassis in there. And that just slips into place like that. It gets a few screws to hold it in. Before I do that, though, I'm actually going to pull the power truck apart one more time because I was doing some testing with it, and I really think it can be better than what it is now because it really is... I mean, it's really so weak that it can barely pull itself around the layout, and I think it can be better. So one thing I want to try real quick 
is seeing if the magnet is really up to its full strength. I mean, it feels like it still has some decent magnetism, but um, I recently got this remagnetizer from Ronald Dodd, and I thought I'd go ahead and do a little experiment with it here, see if it makes much of a difference. I've already used this remagnetizer a couple times before, just for some experimentation, and it seems to do a good job. So, that's all there is to it. I'll just uh, push that back into there, get things lined up. We'll see if that made it stronger. Yeah, that does feel stronger. It's really sticking hard to the screwdriver. Well, let's hook it up, make sure it still works. Because I have also found out what happens if you accidentally put the magnet in backwards or just the wrong direction altogether. Of course, this motor doesn't have good low speed control no matter what you do. And I need to re-oil that. But it's running strong and it's going in the correct direction. Ow. That was smart. It feels pretty strong though. So let's get this back together, see how it all does. All right, let's see how this does with the remagnetized motor and a slight adjustment to the side frames to make sure there was no binding with the axles. It's looking pretty good. Still not perfect since there's only four wheel lift we'll pick up. Some weight might help with that. And if needed, I can add some electrical wipers later to help out with that. But other than that, running quality is looking pretty good. All right, it's finally time to get this thing together and finished. So, like I showed before, chassis just drops into place. Line it up with those screw holes. Let's see, it's a bit of a tight fit into there. That looks right, I think. Yeah, okay. So, just do one screw at a time, we'll see what happens. It really is a finicky model to work on. Getting all that screw alignment just right. Hoping for the best. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, so it looks like the threaded hole isn't quite lined up with the lower plate hole. So I'll take the tip of my file, see if I can push that out a little. Okay, I think that is one down. Let's see if the other three will go in. After a little more testing, I found that binding seems to be coming from these wheel flanges touching the fiber plate here. So I think if I just maybe add a washer in there to um, raise the body up on the truck a little bit, it should take care of the binding and make this run a whole lot smoother. And there is the finished and fully assembled model. And I think that came out looking really, really good. So let's uh, get this over to the track for its final bit of testing and make sure it's all working the way it should. All right, so that washer that I added on top of the truck to hold the body up a little made a huge difference. And one more little adjustment I made was to loosen the screw for the rear truck just a little bit because it was having some trouble um, pivoting and equalizing. And that also made a really big difference for electrical pickup. And overall, this has turned out to be at least a decent runner. It's pretty smooth, mostly steady. Just a slight slowdown here and there. Overall, that's not bad.
still loses power a little bit on switches sometimes when it hits just the right spot, but the equalization of the rear truck really helped out a lot with that. Most of the time, it works perfectly fine. So with that, the build and restoration and all that is finished, and this is a ready-to-run model. Now, getting on to the review of the model, I would say that this is an overall good first attempt at a powered model by Athern. They made a lot of interesting decisions, some which I like, some which I don't like quite so much. And considering that this was done before they had any ability to do any plastic injection molding, some of them were kind of necessities just because of the tooling that they had at the time. One of the things that I really like about this model is the all-metal construction, from the die-cast ends to the steel inner and outer bodies. And when you're making a model of a prototype that was made from corrugated sheet metal, I mean, what better material to use than corrugated sheet metal? So that looks really good on here. And the die-cast metal parts and all that, they just give it a good heft. The steel body gives it really good strength all around, so it just feels really substantial compared to the plastic ones that they sold later on. Now with this being such an early model in Athern's history, the quality of the die-cast metal isn't the best. There's a lot of lines, pitting, and other things around which are just clearly visible and pretty difficult to fill in without some significant rework, so even after my own attempts at filling and sanding, it still ended up showing quite a bit of the metal imperfections throughout after I got finished with the metalizing. From a distance, you barely see that, and it's still a decent looking part overall. And the end pieces, I mean, there was a, some flash on them to get rid of. I missed a couple little bits here and there, but overall, the casting quality is good. And again, in some areas, if you look uh, close up, you can see some evidence of pitting and lines, which just might not be visible on some of their later die-cast parts. So this is one area where they definitely improved with quality later on. Another thing that I really like is, thanks to the sheet metal inner and outer shells, that window glazing material that they give you to put in there, to slide in there, has an almost flush fit that just makes it look really, really good all around. I like this better than the molded plastic inserts that they did later on. It just has much better clarity and a better scale appearance, and it even gives you a bit of that window frame look, even if it's not perfectly done, because the sides are slightly separated from each other, it gives it a nice appearance that's just not quite so possible with the common plastic model from Athern. And since the main body is steel sheet metal, they couldn't just mold grab irons into it, so having the separate grab irons on that part of the body gives it a better scale appearance. The die cast parts, the grab irons are cast onto there, so I just put a little bit of chrome paint on them to help them stand out a little more, but the separate railings definitely look better. And one other thing about this model, which is kind of a negative, and I think one thing that Model Railroader complained about in their review back in the early 50s, is that separation between the steel shell and the die cast end pieces, which is very plainly obvious no matter how good of a job you do building these. So that takes a little bit away from its um, scale, realistic appearance, but I think with the overall quality of it, it still doesn't look too bad, at least from a distance, but if you're going for a really good scale appearance, it definitely takes away from the model to have that gap there. And for a couple more things I like about this model, it's the fact that the body is mostly hollow instead of being filled with the motor and drive line, so you can pretty easily add interior detailing there, like I did. Of course, I didn't go about the easiest way of doing it, designing and printing out my own interior, but it just being able to do that is very nice, I would say. And then the last thing I would say that I really like about the detail is having those separate springs in the trucks, even if they were 
a little tedious to install. They look a lot better than the cast metal springs in the later trucks. Now for some direct comparison, I also have one of Atherin's plastic models here. And for this one, I'd say that a lot of parts of the detail are better and more realistic than their early metal one. The windows are uh, more to scale in their sizing and they have that bit of framing around them, which is good. The, some of the other details like the number board and other parts around the sides, they just have a better scale flush appearance. Although this one here, of course, is the tab for latching the body on. So that can make it a little difficult to paint and add numbers or any lettering there because that can get worn off or chipped away pretty quickly if you're taking the shell on and off. Now one other difference with the plastic model is that um, the it, this is like the Generation 2 RDC, where the metal model is the first generation. So the biggest differences in detail are for the ends of the cabs as well as the pilot areas. The um, first generation RDCs, they're a little flatter, and the pilots are also just a little more open where on the later ones, they streamlined things a little bit. Now, one other thing, which is probably the biggest negative to the scaling of this model is the fact that it's so short compared to the actual scale length of the RDCs. They did that for both these uh, early metal ones as well as the plastic ones later. And that was to make it fit much more easily around 18 inch radius curves. And if you never put these next to the scale length models, you may never notice how far off it is, but once you do put it next to one of those, the difference is immediately apparent. So not only do they remove one of the passenger windows, but they also just reduce a lot of the overall size by quite a bit. So it's not quite two inches shorter in HO scale than it should be, which is a pretty big difference. I think that puts it somewhere around a 70 scale feet instead of the correct 85. So if you want a realistic appearance, the Atherin model is definitely not the way to go. But if you don't care so much about the scale length of it or have a smaller layout, then the Atherin model is a good fit and it does run well around the smaller radius curves. Now, as far as the construction quality, I would say the only negative to using the materials they did was the tin plated steel of the inner and outer bodies. Like you saw in that whole build and restoration, once that tin plating goes away under certain conditions, the steel can rust out and look really bad. And when that happens, your only options are to either um, paint, remove the rust and paint over it with metalizer like I did, or really strip it down and replate it, which would be a huge and long and difficult process. So if that happens, I think um, using the metalizer like this is the way to go because that can really make it look good again. Now for the power truck and chassis design, as you've already seen, there were a lot of good ideas, but bad execution behind it. The gears being all metal, they're gonna last a long time. The helical cut makes them smooth running, but the gear ratio is just completely wrong for a motor of this level of torque and for the speed that this model should be able to run at. In testing, I well, in testing, I found that the speed was about 150 steel miles per hour on average at 12 volts. So that's just way too fast for an RDC, which goes for gear to run at 85 steel miles per hour, which is achievable in the range of about eight to eight and a half volts. Well, of course, that's unrealistic, save for one single RDC that the New York Central put together in 1966, where they strapped two jet engines to the front of it, and it got up to just about 184 miles per hour. But unless you're modeling that one, this chassis is just way too fast. And for low speed, 
it's just about the worst I've ever tested with extremely inconsistent running. Sometimes the motor just has trouble starting at all because it's not, even with the recharged magnet, it's just not strong enough sometimes to overcome the uh, resistance and with that low torque of the high speed gear. And then of course, sometimes it loses power like that. Let's uh, give that a little push and get it going again. And give it a little more voltage too. So anyway, about the low speed, the best I've been able to get out of it is 10 scale miles per hour, but that's only for short bursts before it either takes off or it stops moving altogether. So yeah, definitely not good at all for low speed control. It's uh, very poorly geared for the motor that was in there. Now, if they had used a single threaded worm, then that would have put the speed of this at closer to the 80, maybe about 80 or 90 scale miles per hour, which would have been just about perfect for the RDC. So yeah, just a poor design decision for the gearing, but once it's up to speed and running, it's not a bad runner. It's pretty smooth. The noise is average for its day. The current draw running free is about 0.6 amps on average. And the ventilation around the motor I think it'll keep it from overheating, but I do also notice the top of the body getting pretty warm after a long session of running. And as for pulling anything, well, good luck with that. Now, as fast and low torque as that gear ratio may be, it's still a slower speed ratio than the rubber band drives that came later. Now, of course, those ended up having about the same top speed just because the motor was so bogged down by the uh, resistance in the mechanism. And one other problem with those rubber band drive units was the axle drum it was just about the same diameter as the wheels themselves. So running over switches or a re-railer like this one at a grade crossing and such could result in the wheels actually lifting up and off the track, which would happen with the um, plastic one that I have here. So what I did with my plastic model, since it wasn't running well on my layout, I got the Ernst Reed gear kit for it, which adds a flywheel and takes it down to just one truck driving it, but you end up with a much, much better scale speed and a very smooth runner that can go over those switches, crossings, and re-railers. So as far as best running models go, an after with the Ernst gear kit is really as good as you can get without replacing the mechanism entirely. So yeah, this has had a decent amount of time to run in, and you can see that it's still kind of slowing down when it gets to curves in certain areas where just a little bit of resistance is added, and then it speeds back up once it straightens out. So yeah, really low torque mechanism, and Atherin really did a lot better later on, but for our first attempt where they had never made a running model before, if you can do the work on it to tune it up and get everything just right, you can get a smooth runner. So to sum up on this review of the Atherin RDC, the detail is not great in some areas, good in others. I like some of the decisions they made. I don't like some of the other decisions they've made. The casting quality, not the best. Looks good from a distance though. The steel construction gives it a nice realistic appearance about around the corrugated metal, but has the problem of rusting when the tin plating disappears. Mechanical quality has some good design decisions, but poor engineering that led to this being not a good runner at all without some extensive rework and even after that it's still only a halfway decent runner I would say. So if you're in the market for an RDC this is the last one I would recommend getting. The plastic models are a better out of the box experience because they're so much easier to work on and make into at least decent runners 
and you don't have to deal with the really finicky construction quality of the different kit components. But if you want a really realistic RDC, one that's um, to scale for its length and just a better runner, go for a Proto 1000 or Rapido or even one of the brass models that's out there. Any one of those is going to be a better model than this. In the end though, I am glad that I got this one. I would only recommend it for someone like me who's looking for an interesting challenge or just likes to collect some of these older pieces. Because it really is a unique piece of model railroading history being Atherin's first attempt at a powered model. And they, of course, had a lot of good things to come after this one.